afternoon. Thank you all for showing up today to make this event take place. My name is Sean Miller, and I'm the head of the Okinawa Underwater Photographic Society. I'm an underwater photographer, nature photographer, and I've been diving here in Okinawa since 1992, so I spent a lot of time here. Um, in the future, if there is anybody that does want to give a presentation on marine science, underwater photography, videography, or dive safety, uh, please contact me directly through Facebook, through Messenger, and we can go ahead and make it happen, okay? Now, as you all know, uh, diving is a safe and enjoyable hobby. It's one of my favorite passions, but there are hazards involved in it, right? And it's very important to be familiar with the sea conditions, the tides, uh, and the weather forecast. We have some really good sites out there. We have uh, Front Page of Canal, and it's actually ran by Gary Hughes. And so you can check that out on Facebook. Every Friday he posts the weather forecast so you can get familiar with it and plan your dive to avoid any hazard, okay? Also, if you want to learn more about the hazardous marine life of Okinawa and treatments, you can check out my site, okinawanaturephotography.com. And uh, just go ahead and follow my work there or, or check it out if you want to learn more about it specifically to actually Okinawa, okay? <clears throat> So tonight the presentation will be recorded, so be respectful, keep the noise down, keep your phones off so there's no ringing going on. If you want to take photos as the presentation is going on, you're welcome to, you're welcome to post them on Facebook, share them, get the word out so people know that this, this actually exists, okay? <clears throat> now, tonight's presentations, um, we're gonna have the present presentation will be on a hyperbaric chamber for dive injuries and dive safety. Now our presenters, we will have master diver Daniel Silver and undersea and diving medical expert, Dr. Eric Koch. So let's go ahead and give a round of applause for the gentleman. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> so I'm Dan Stover. Like you said, thanks for having us out tonight. Thanks for uh, letting us come spread and share the word about uh, a little bit of diving safety. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do is get ahead of an issue. It's pretty early in the season already, and uh, we've seen a couple of, of uh, pretty severe uh, decompression sickness cases. Uh, Doc Koch and I, Dr. Uh, Eric Koch and I have. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm a, I am in the U.S. Navy. I'm a U.S. Navy uh, qualified master diver. Uh, I've been diving for 17 years. I've been in Norfolk, Virginia, dove there, fixing ships and submarines, uh, San Diego, California, Guam, I was in Guam for seven years. Um, I spent some time in the Middle East diving in the uh, Persian Gulf and in the Red Sea, and now I'm out here in Okinawa. So I've been here for a year, and in a year, I've, I've seen already uh, si six or seven diving-related casualties in our chamber. So um, the intention here is just to get ahead of that problem. I know some of you here are scientists, instructors, you're probably pretty familiar with diving. This may be a review for some of you. The intention is hopefully, uh, if, if somebody in here takes something away, pays it forward, passes it on, we can prevent a, a casualty later on. All right, so we're gonna talk about basically just preparing for your dive, a little bit of general diving safety, some casualty management in the event we do find ourselves in a casualty, and then we're going to talk a little bit about recompression chambers. I'm going to show you some pictures of some, what we have up at Camp Schwab, which is where I'm at, and uh, some of the stuff you see at the hospitals. So planning your dive. Like, like I said, I know most of you probably dive pretty regularly around here. Um, but just to take it back to the basics real quick, something that I like to do if it's a recreational dive is just make sure somebody knows. Make sure somebody knows what's, wh where you're going, where you're going to be. If it's just you and a buddy, let them know, you know your exact location, where you're putting in at where you're getting out at, what time, and when they should expect you back. Uh, Sean already talked a little bit about some places you can go to get good weather, sea state, current, that type of condition. Make sure you know what you're getting into, what your, uh, what your plan is, right? Bottom conditions, where are you gonna be diving? Are you diving a reef, a wreck? Uh, what are the currents down there? What are the water temperatures? Do you need rubber? Do you need a wetsuit? Uh, do you not need one? Should you have some sort of chafing gear, gloves, et cetera? Continuing on, you want to make sure you know the depths in the area. Not just exactly where you're going to be diving, right, but the surrounding area as well. If you drift off the wreck or drift off the reef, what are, what are the chances of you hitting the bottom being at 130 feet when you're planning to be 60 feet? 
Uh, what do you, how long you plan to stay? What do you, how much air do you have available to make that dive? Uh, make sure you can calculate your air consumption, right? So you want to make sure you know how much time you have available at that depth that you plan in to dive. And then maybe if you, uh, a little air factor, end up a little bit deeper than you plan, you know how much air you have available for that as well. And then review that plan with your buddies, buddy or buddies, however many people you have diving with you. Make sure everybody knows what you're doing. Equipment checks. So, you know, spring comes around, water's starting to warm up, start pulling that gear out of the closet, right? It's been sitting up all fall, all winter. Make sure, uh, make sure you know when the last time that stuff was serviced. All right, check your regulators, check your BCDs, check your cylinder hydros. When are they, uh, have they been uh, visually inspected? And if not, then get them serviced. If you're, if you're qualified to service your stuff, service it. If not, take it to somebody that is. Visually check, make sure nothing's dry rotted, your straps, your buckles, all, nothing's broken. Your watch, and bat, your watch and computer batteries are all good. Make sure you got uh, batteries in your flashlights, knives are sharpened. Everything you're supposed to have is in good working order because your life basically is going to depend on that stuff. Bring extra batteries too. So function checks before you, uh, before you even leave the house, before you even load it in the car, go ahead and just check everything. Is your regulator working? Your octopus working? Uh, is your over bottom set on your first stages? Power inflators, lights working, just the same stuff we talked about, right? Recheck your equipment on site before, you're ever, before you even get in the water. Recheck your equipment and always make sure you check your buddy's equipment. It's important to check your buddy's equipment because if your buddy has an issue, you need to know how to work with that equipment right if you if you need to help your buddy out so make sure you know your buddy's equipment and you've helped your buddy out by checking that person's equipment here's a big one so a couple of the last uh, incidents we saw uh, in both incidences uh, those were pretty severe decompression sickness cases and in both instances the divers dove deeper than what their recommended uh, certification limits allowed not saying that was a contributing factor, however, it was outside their limits. And for one of them, it was well outside of their comfort limit as well. So just dive within your limit, dive what you're certified to, um, know your buddy's limits, all right? Stay within your comfort zone. All right, during the dive, uh, it's important, uh, you know, everything's great down there. We're looking at the fish, we're watching the reef, whatever we're doing, taking pictures. Make sure you, you're paying attention to your cylinder pressures. Check your cylinder pressures every couple of minutes. Check your depth every couple of minutes. And don't be scared to reach over there and grab your buddy's console and check his or her depth as well. All right, just make sure nobody's exceeded that depth limit. Check their pressure. Make sure they're paying attention as well. Take care, take care of each other. Take care of your buddy. All right, individual health. So if you're sick before you even start the dive, probably ought to think about just packing it up and wait until, wait until it clears up. If you got uh, congested lungs, um, nasal congestion, you're just gonna, you're just gonna have problems. It's gonna, and it's gonna happen. If you got nasal problems, it might happen on ascent. Then you got real issues because you got to get to the surface, right? <clears throat> so if you got a, 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 a sinus squeeze, it's gonna be a bad day. Also, uh, any kind of type of lung congestion is a uh, contributing factor to arterial gas embolism. You also want to make sure you don't have any skin infections too, because if you got open, open skin infections and something gets in there from the water, it's going to be a bad day. Phys physically, you know, we're not, nobody in here, probably, well, maybe some of you are triathletes or something like that, but for the most part, you know, us normal human beings, uh, just keep in mind that nitrogen is five times as soluble in fat as in water. So that means uh, the more fat we have, the more nitrogen loads in, and then that nitrogen takes a while to off gas. So basically, the more out of shape we are, the more likely we are to have a, uh, a uh, decompression sickness. Alcohol and diving. One of, one of the things that uh, was always taught to me was diving, it, the stress that we put on our lungs, on our circulatory system and respiratory system, depending on the depth and what we're actually doing, is the equivalent of running a half marathon. So keep that in mind when you're uh, having some beer, you know, the night before the dive. Would you do that before? You go out and run a marathon? Probably not. So just keep that in mind. Um, hydrate before your dive. Don't, don't consume any alcohol before you dive. But certainly don't consume any alcohol that day. No drinking and diving. 
flying. So gen general rule is 24 hours. I'm sure most people are aware of that. Don't fl try not to fly or don't fly anywhere 24 hours after a dive. There are some tables out there that'll give you, uh, that'll really narrow it down for you depending on uh, how deep your dive was, how long you were there, and uh, it can give you exact times. But as a general rule, try not to have any out ascent to altitude within 24 hours. That includes ascending over a mountain too. So keep that in mind when you're crossing the island, ascending 1,000, 2,000 feet, something like that, or if you're diving in the mountains. All right, so despite all your best efforts, you know, you did everything right, there is still that, always that chance that something's gonna happen, right? So it's important to know to already have a plan in place so that you know what to do in the event you do have a casualty, right? So obviously you wanna recover your stricken diver into the boat, recall and recover all your other divers, make sure you got accountability of all your other divers. Place the diver, if you have it available, we always wanna get that diver on 100% oxygen as soon as possible, buy mask if possible, uh, coordinate with EMS to meet at the nearest uh, possible point. So if you're out on a boat doing a boat dive, try to coordinate with EMS uh, to get an ambulance to a dock or pier nearest to you. That way, especially if you don't have oxygen, because that EMS is going to be able to trans transit a lot quicker to the ambulance or to the hospital, and they're going to have most likely have oxygen on board. So when you do transfer them over into the ambulance, make sure that you let them know that this person needs to be on oxygen, and then. Uh, start fluids if possible. And then just call ahead and contact the ER to notify them because then if it is a, a sure thing, slam dunk decompression sickness case, they can start coordinating with the chambers, local chambers, our chamber, somewhere to get the diver to uh, where they need to be. So what's gonna happen? Like I said, they're gonna be you're gonna be transported or whoever, whoever it is gonna be transported on 100% O2 if it's available. Um, you're most likely going to start getting fluids as soon as possible by IV. Um, at the ER, you're going to continue breathing 100% oxygen. You're going to start getting neurological exams. The examiners are going to start checking you out, see if there's anything else going on or whatever your symptoms are. Uh, you're going to, they're going to consult with a diving medical officer and or myself. And then they're going to uh, arrange for transportation to a chamber, whichever chamber they're able to coordinate with. So once you get to the chamber, they're gonna do, you're gonna get more neurological exams. They're gonna, they're gonna check you out, check out all your cranial nerves, do uh, sensory checks, strength checks, just to see, make sure you have all your strength, sensory, mental status is intact, all right, or, or not, and how bad it is, so we can gauge the, uh, how, how much better you're getting. Uh, you're gonna be pressed most likely to 60 feet in a chamber, similar to this, and you're gonna get 100% O2 again at depth in the chamber. Uh, find yourself in this uh, situation, make sure that the stricken diver has with them their dive history, whether that's their computer or somebody who knows the exact depths of the dive, where they were diving, what they were doing, right? Like, and that's why we want the dive partner there too. And then any contact info, emergency contact info, next to kin, wife, husband, something like that. All right, so generally, the treatments are gonna be realistically anywhere from about four and a half to nine hours. Um, and then there's gonna be a one hour to six hour post treatment observation, just depending on the condition of the patient and if we can get the patient back up to the hospital. And then uh, if it's severe enough, the uh, diver can expect a stay at the hospital. So we'll just look at a couple of tables here. Uh, some of the standard Navy treatment tables. This is a treatment table nine. This is the one It's more around the uh, lines of an hour and a half like that previous slide said. However, uh, this isn't gonna be our primary treatment table. We'll use this treatment table if uh, we have a diver who didn't have complete resolution of symptoms following the first treatment. So we could come back and treat them with this uh, treatment table to clear up any unresolved symptoms. So, in the green, in the green, this is oxygen time. Down right there is the depth of the treatment table. So we're gonna take them down to 45 feet. We're gonna do 30 minutes on O2, five minutes air, 30 O2, five air, 30 O2 again, and then bring them back to the surface. Relatively short table, just trying to saturate them with oxygen, heal up any remaining injuries. 
This table doesn't get extended, it's straightforward. Pretty basic. This is most likely going to be the initial treatment table, most all decompression sickness cases. All right, we're going to take them down to 20 or 60 feet. We're going to do a 20 minute O2 period, five minute air break, 20 minute O2 period. I'm sorry, this is a five. This is for, this is going to be for type one decompression sickness, um, except for skin symptoms. So we won't get too much into that, but uh, basically if you have that, you've heard, everybody's heard the joint pain, right? The knee pain, that type of stuff. Those are type one symptoms. So we're going to do 20 minutes, five minute break, 20 minutes, and then ascend to 30 feet, and then we're going to do another, uh, another O2 period there. We can extend these O2 periods, so you can get more on these. This is the one you're most likely going to see. All right, treatment table six, a little bit longer. Minimum is going to be about four and a half hours. Uh, we did one about a month and a half ago that went nine and, nine and a half hours. So that was, we did two extensions here at 60 feet two 20 minute extensions, so it was an extra 40 minutes O2 and two extra five minute air breaks. And then we did two 60 minute extensions at 30 feet. It was a, it was a long night. Six alpha is the exact same as the previous table with the exception of initial depth of the, ta of the table is 165 feet. Basically what that's doing is, uh, you know, the theory of the bubble, right? This is compressing the bubble, trying to crush the bubble, and then to restore blood flow, and then bringing them back to 60 feet at a slow rate in order to get them back on oxygen to start the oxygen therapy. And then this one can also be extended here and here for two periods each. So we'll look at a couple chambers here. This is your most basic uh, chamber, a lot of people use this uh, expeditionary type of divers that like to go out in the middle of nowhere. They're funded and sponsored and have all kinds of money and they get one of these uh, Kevlar uh, sleeves with acrylic viewports in the ends of them and uh, basically you can put a person in here. It's pressurized with these scuba cylinders controlled right here from the console and there's oxygen going in, into it right through here and the diver will sit in there by himself in this, in this emergency escape hyperbaric stretcher um, with oxygen on his face uh, being treated while we transport him. This is a helicopter. You can transport uh, in a helicopter or you can transport in an ambulance and then you could take and transfer this stretcher into a larger chamber, press that larger chamber down, equalize, equalize the two. So if this is at 60 feet, you put it in the chamber, pressurize the chamber to 60 feet and then you can bring them out and then continue the treatment or treat them, do the whole treatment in there, depending on how far away you are from a, from a real chamber. But this is not anything you want to base your plans on for diving. This is an emergency escape hyperbaric stretcher. So here's a monoplace chamber. These are typically used for uh, hyperbaric medicine, wound care type of stuff. Um, this, it's also pretty small, but a little more control in the fact that you're already in a facility. Uh, somebody's there to monitor to you. However, there's nobody in there with you to take care of you if, you're, if it's severe. So if you have a severe patient, a severe diver, um, say paralysis or something like that, this, this isn't really a choice chamber. This wouldn't be my primary choice if I had options. So again, this is not a chamber to base your plans on. This is a U.S. Navy transportable recompression chamber. Uh, I, we actually have one of these. We maintain one of these. Uh, there is another lock that can mate to it right here, so it can be a double lock chamber, but as it stands, the one that's on this island right here is a single lock um, for, because it's more mobile, mobile and expeditionary for what we do with it for military purposes. But uh, basically, same thing. You get, you, we can put a tender inside of this to tend the patient, so it's a little bit better than the previous two However, not optimal, but it will work to save a life. This chamber, those previous two chambers, this one, they may go to 45, some of them are 30 feet, some of them are 45 feet. I don't think I've ever seen any other 60 feet, these monoplace, so you're not gonna get a real treatment table six alpha. Um, but this one we can take to 165 feet 
or yeah, we can take the 165 feet and do a six alpha. Next one, standard Navy double lock. This is also another chamber that we maintain up on Camp Schwab. This is, uh, we're moving up from budget to economy here. Um, it's a double lock chamber, so we can basically lock other people in, lock people out as the treatment goes on. Those longer treatments, that nine and a half hour treatment I was talking about, um, it's still terrible conditions for nine and a half hours. I guess if you want to imagine yourself in here for nine and a half hours, go get in the back of a Mini Cooper and close the door and lay down in the, in the uh, back seat for a little while and that's about what it's like with somebody hovered over the top of you because that's where the tender sits and that's where the patient lays. Ask Cam back there, he rode, a, he rode the nine and a half hour treatment with the patient. All right, now we're in business class. This is a medical facility chamber. This is what you're gonna see at the big hospitals. Um, they can, as you can see, it looks like business class seats over here, probably recliners or something, I don't know. You can roll gurneys in them. They have the locks on them. Super comfortable, optimal for long treatments. However, not realistic. Most hospitals don't really have this. The, the one at Nambu is, is it, it's not this big. Yeah, it's not this big. This is, uh, this is top of the line type of uh, luxury stuff. But nonetheless, it all does the same thing. Compress the bubble, uh, supply oxygen, and allow time for oxygen reabsorption to, uh, to heal the, uh, the body of the decompression sickness symptoms. And that's probably the last one. Yep. So I asked if you have any questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Koch. And uh, I guess we're saving all questions to the end. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. We're going to take a five-minute break so I can ditch the, uh, the microphone here to Dr. Koch. And then uh, we'll start back in five minutes. Good? All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We waiting for anyone else? Maybe. That's right. All right, so my name is Eric Koch. Uh, I am civilian trained for all, all the medical aspects of it. I uh, went to New York College of Osteopathic Medicine and then commissioned in the Navy. So that, then I got uh, my, all of my dive training was really on the, the military side of the house, right? So I uh, went down to Navy Dive School and uh, got a lot of the, the medical uh, components of that. So I've been out on the island for about two years. Uh, I also do uh, you know, a lot of recreational diving in addition to our, our active duty diving. Um, it's a little bit more fun that way too. But um, the reason why we're here is really because over the past two years, we've treated about, about 10 patients in our chamber, uh, all recreational divers. Um, our active duty divers, our Navy divers, our, our Air Force divers, our Army divers, we cover down on their dives too. Our tables are very, very conservative with which where we dive. We all know there is some inherent risk to diving, that even if you have the perfect conditions, you, there may be a cause for decompression sickness. You still may get that, right? So the way the Navy dive tables and all the research is done, they're built to be very conservative. So pending any sort of uh, mistake or um, equipment malfunction, that person will not get bent, right? The recreational tables, obviously there's a lot of different, uh, different algorithms out there. Um, and you can also adjust those algorithms. You can set them to different percentages of, of, what, of how conservative you're diving. So diving is safe, right? But these injuries do happen. Uh, some are worse than others, right? Not all of them need to go into the chamber, like we were saying, right? Some of those, some of those uh, pain symptoms don't necessarily need to go in, right? So a lot of them can be treated with just oxygen. So we are here, though, because I want to try to push out some information as well. I know a lot of people have very varied experience here, a lot of instructors. Um, I know the PADI courses, uh, some of the other courses. I'm more familiar with the PADI courses than the other ones. But they go into some of that dive medicine, right? You learn a little bit about the signs and symptoms. But it's always good to have a little refresher, right, especially for our instructors out there so that they know, uh, or our rescue divers, so that they know how to identify some of these injuries and what to do after those injuries, right? So we'll kind of, uh, some of that stuff will be a little bit more medical. We'll try to bring it down a little bit. But uh, for the most part, you guys should be picking up on most of what we're going through, right? So these are some of the topics. 
So ultimately, uh, that overarching theme is decompression illness. So decompression illness has kind of been split out into decompression sickness and then this pulmonary overinflation syndrome, right? Patty refers to that as that lung overexpansion injury. So it, it, in the Navy, in, in the military, we call it POIS, right? Just for short. So that's a little bit easier than L-O-E-I. I don't know if that makes a word, but um, poise is, is the easiest way, right? So that's a pulmonary overinflation, sin overinflation syndrome. And then that non-pulmonary bar barotrauma, so kind of those, those ear issues is the main topic. So we'll hit that at the end. So the, the first thing we look at is, so when, when I see a patient, I've also gotten a lot of phone calls from the ER for some of the, the less minor, the less uh, in extremis patients and that have also been pushed out to the local chamber. Um, so we get a lot of stories, right? And my question is always, number one, I want to make sure they're, they're on oxygen already at that point. Number two, what was their dive profile, right? What's their diving history? Any predis predisposing factors, which, uh, which Dan mentioned a few of those previously. Any previous symptoms? Have you ever had a dive injury in the past? And then past and present medical history, right? Everyone, we have divers that, you know, are, are now as young as, you know, 10 years old, maybe even younger. Um, to, you know, as old as in their, you know, 70s, 80s probably. Um, so it's important to know kind of that past medical history as well because some, some different uh, illnesses can predispose you to dive injuries. As far as the dive history goes, we want to know the depth, the bottom time. What kind of rig were they diving? Was it, was it a closed circuit, open circuit? Um, was it kind of mixed air, nitrox? What were we, what were, what are we looking at, right? Did they have any problems during the dive? Were they, were they having issues clearing at all? Uh, any buoyancy issues? Um, that the most recent, uh, one of the most recent illnesses that casualties that we treated. Um, you know, if you have an issue at, at 40 feet and you're ascending and start having some issues clearing or having some issues with your mask and you kind of lose where you're at, you're going to ascend pretty quick if, you're, if your BCD still has some air in it. So what were the bottom conditions, right? That's important surf conditions, what's the water temp. Uh, out here it's pretty nice and comfortable all the time, but those cold water temperatures definitely predispose you to some more injuries. Were there any obstructions, uh, any altitude exposure, you know, previously uh, or after? You know, we've also had folks come in from, hey, I was just down uh, in another country diving and then flew back and then, uh, then I went diving again and then now, now I'm having some issues. So those are also other questions we ask. And then, uh, do you have a dive buddy? Surprisingly, going back to Dan's lecture about the chambers, not everywhere you dive in the world, even if it's a really popular dive site, will have the best hyperbaric chamber. So for instance, Palau. Palau does not have a very good chamber, and that's probably one of the most popular sites that, that, we di that you can dive. Um, so you, you really don't want to get injured in certain places. Um, because it may be more than just transporting to a chamber on island, right? It may be trying to fly you out, medevac you somewhere. So pre-dive, um, we want to different predisposing factors, right? So any sort of heat stress, dehydration, definitely, definitely is, is a well-known predisposing factor. Uh, fatigue, drugs, or alcohol, right? That's important stuff. Now, while they're descending or at the bottom, did, did you have any experience, any barotrauma, any vertigo, uh, that dizziness, lightheadedness, any hypoxia or uh, nitrogen narcosis, right? And then upon ascending, uh, did you have any symptoms of, or did you uh, experience pulmonary overinflation, vertigo, right? And then on the surface, that's when we start really evaluating for decompression illness versus, and, and then your DCS versus your AGE, your arterial gas embolism. So decompression sickness goes back to really the, the 1800s. So um, other synonyms for it is DCS, decompression illness, the Benz or Quezon's disease. These pictures are all from, from back in the 1800s. About 1871, uh, one of the most like, notable sites was when they were building the Brooklyn Bridge. And they have these, these caissons here. Um, where it's compressed air pushed down into, you know, into about 30 meters underground. And people were coming up in the 10s, 20s um, with decompression symptoms, right? And they didn't really know what it was at that time. They did more, more studies. They did more safety. They improved safety. They had hyperbaric chambers on site at some point. So there's kind of been a very up and down over the past, you know, 150 years or so popularity of hyperbaric chambers, are we using it for, for wound care? But for dive injuries, it's, all, it's, always been, it's always been there, right? 
So DCS is that pathologic response to the formation of bubbles from gas dissolved in tissue due to a reduction in ambient pressure, right? So you're at depth and you take you on gas. You take all this, all this nitrogen mainly uh, into all your tissues, right? And you get oxygen in there, that, but that nitrogen hangs on, hangs on significantly longer. So as you start ascending, you know, depending on how quickly you're, you're ascending, uh, will allow more or less nitrogen to escape the tissues. And if you ascend too quickly or accumulated too much nitrogen while you were, while you were diving, that nitrogen is going to start forming bubbles, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to get stuck in those tissues. So, uh, as I said, that nitrogen starts coming out, it gets dissolved, the, the nitrogen that's dissolved starts coming out of solution, right? And this leads to that formation of bubbles inside and outside of the blood vessels, right? So we have intravascular and extravascular bubbles that form up. And those are the potential cause of DCS. That's the best that research has shown that these bubbles. There's definitely other causes we know because we haven't, you know, there's been cases of DCS that we haven't seen these bubbles in. So there, there certainly are other causes, but this is the most notable cause, right? It's these bubbles that are, that are causing issues. Inside the blood vessels, right? So those, those bubbles are either kind of in that venous system or, the arterial, or on, the, on the arterial system. And then it also forms outside of the blood vessels in your tissues, right? And then the direct effects that these, bubble ha these bubbles have, if you think of it like mechanically, these bubbles are going to plug up spots that you need blood to flow to. So it's going to go to kind of those nerve endings, those capillaries, and that's where those bubbles are going to plug up, right? They can also cross into the arterial circulation. Most of the time with decompression sickness, you're going to see them on that venous circulation. So they'll get returned to your heart, your body will kind of filter out, filter out those bubbles, and you may not see worse effects. But there are certain conditions um, and certain instances where it's a big enough load of nitrogen bubbles they'll cross into the arterial system, and then that's when you start having those, those neurological effects right, in the brain. And then indirect effects are, are effects that these bubbles cause, kind of, they're, they're for, they're, it's a foreign body for you, right? So the body's gonna start uh, having some blood clotting issues, gonna have some inflammation, and then create some leaky blood vessels. So these are kind of the, sim the indirect symptoms we see. And then what's the latency of DCS? You know, 90% of the DCS, 90% of DCS is going to present within that first really 24 hours. But you can have some symptoms that present sooner, uh, and certainly some that uh, present take a little bit longer to present. But most of the time, you'll see them within 24 hours, right? Overall, most cases you'll see within 12, um, but they've def the, but the 90% number is is at 24, All right? So. Uh, the CNS symptoms, so your central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord, you'll see those symptoms usually a lot quicker. It's more the kind of pain only DCS that you'll see taking a little bit longer. All right, so what are the risk factors? And, and, and Dan kind of went through some of these as well. Um, your dehydration, your alcohol, your fatigue. Uh, older age uh, definitely has, has some effect. Uh, increased BMI, we said. And then uh, if you're exercising at depth too, kind of tends to cause, cause more symptoms as well, right? And if you're doing the repet dives. So types of DCS, so we have type one and type two. So type one is more your pain only, that musculoskeletal DCS. And you'll also see some cutaneous symptoms as type one, that's more the skin, and I'll have a picture of that later, and then the lymphatic symptoms. And that's those leaky blood vessels, right, will cause you to have some swelling, some some fluid coming out of the lymphatic system. And then type two, that's your more serious, right? That's your pulmonary, your, uh, your neuro neurological, uh, and then the inner ear also will be type two symptoms. Now, does this really matter? It matters when I'm seeing the patient because that's when uh, I'm gonna kinda, we're gonna determine how we're gonna treat the patient. But for the most part, we lean more towards treating the patient for that full kinda at least four and a half hour treatment that we wanna do. So type 1 DCS, that's, that's really no, best known as that pain-only DCS, right? So it's usually that dull, vague, deep, aching pain. It's usually unaffected by movement. Uh, I just think of this one patient that we had was having some sh dull shoulder pain, and he kept going like this. He's like, it's just, it's just there. It's just deep in there. And no matter which way he would move it, it's not getting any worse. Um, it's not getting any better, right? So it's just dull, aching in there, right? And, and the most common joints for that are the shoulder, the elbow and the knee. And we kind of consider those outside of this like t-shirt and shorts pattern or tank top and shorts pattern, 
right? And the reason why is, you know, even though you think of like your hips as, as your extremity too, if, if, if you have pain in your hips, uh, kind of pain, pain anywhere kind of inside along your torso, those are definitely more concerning symptoms, right? With, with how close it is to the spine and your central nervous system. So typically you have the shoulder, elbow, knee, right? And then the skin symptoms is something called cutis marmorata, right? So you have marbling or mottling or itching and burning of the skin. And we've seen this a few times as well. Um, you kind of get this rash, right? It's a little bit itchy. And that's due to kind of these bubbles forming that kind of indirect effects where they have this vascular congestion and they, have, they cause this, this itchy rash. So what do we do for these patients? Uh, you know, the best thing is get them on oxygen early, right? So I know, I know there's a number of folks trained on, on how to give oxygen. Some of us have access to oxygen, some of us don't. But it's important, as soon as you can get this person on oxygen, the better. So if that means calling the ambulance to meet you at the port, as opposed to saying, hey, my car's right there, I'll just drive them to the ER, getting oxygen on earlier is always going to help. A lot of times, all these patients need is some oxygen. Right? We've, seen, we've treated a number of patients in the hospital with some of these symptoms with just oxygen. They don't need to go out to a chamber. They don't need to get pressed because oxygen will help. Just breathing that 100% oxygen will help push out a lot of that nitrogen bubbles out of your tissues. So it's important. It's a very, very, very good. I mean, oxygen is a drug, and it's a very good drug. Um, and then just make sure you get to the emergency room. Right, so we talked about the knee pain, the shoulder pain, and then this is cutis marmorata. So kind of that, that modeling or marbling of the skin. Uh, most commonly you'll see seen on the torso, uh, more so that's because that's where we have a lot more of our fat. Um, and it tends to get in, the, that nitrogen tends to hang out in the fat and then cause that vascular congestion there. So, and then we have your type two. So your type two is more of that stuff that I was saying that, that along your torso. So your pulmonary DCS, also known as the chokes. It's very, it is, it is more rare than the other types, um, but it's that substernal, right? Center of the chest discomfort, you may have a cough and it may progress rapidly, um, which is why we need to get it evaluated quick. And then kind of a little bit more scary uh, is the neurological decompression sickness. Uh, where, you have, where you have issues in your bubbles, essentially, in your spinal cord, um, numbness and tingling, whether it's in your upper extremities, more commonly your lower extremities, um, can have some mental status changes. You know, one of the most kind of bizarre things is, is they, the patient might just not be acting normally, right? And you can have some of these very slight neurological symptoms. And just because you have type 2 DCS doesn't mean that you're going to have symptoms of type 1 DCS. So the only thing that may be wrong with your, with your dive buddy or your friend or your spouse, they're just not acting normal, right? And you're really not sure, and you're really not sure like, what, what to do with that. You know, the best thing is get them evaluated. Sometimes just breathing some oxygen for a little bit will help kind of drive out some of those bubbles as well and get them feeling better, right? There is certainly an anxiety component that gets kind of thrown into it. And there's other things that can kind of skew your symptoms, right, of like type 1 DCS. Were you working out that morning? So, but don't, if you're at all concerned that your buddy or your, your student or anybody has some of these symptoms, don't leave it up to you to make that decision, right? Make sure to get them evaluated, right? All right, so transport to the emergency room. Treatment's oxygen, so you're, you're not going to harm them by getting oxygen. Um, and then recompression. So then prevention of DCS. Dive conservatively, I think, I think we've drilled this one in. Uh, if you're diving on tables, maybe, maybe go round up an extra 10 feet, because then you'll be a little bit more conservative. If you're diving on computers, just be smart about it. Uh, be, be cautious when you're approaching those no D limits. And then avoid those risk factors. So now this is kind of the, the second big topic, is that pulmonary overinflation syndrome, or that lung overexpansion, right? So you have your lungs here. And what happens at these kind of arterioles, you have blood, these blood vessels, right up next to these arterioles. And what happens is, if, you're, if you are surfacing uh, too rapidly and you're not exhaling properly, or if you are inhaling and you press down on your purge button, where's the air going to go, right? It's got nowhere else to go. You have a mask on, it's not going to come out your nose. Uh, so it's going to push, it's going to overinflate your lungs. And then you'll have some injury right here at the arterioles. And those, that's where you'll have bubbles kind of push out, whether they just push out into the lungs or push out into the blood vessels, right? You're going to see symptoms from that. All right. So uh, 
causes gas bubbles to, to release, and more commonly it's in the arterial circulation, which the arterial circulation will, will send those bubbles right up to your, out to your spinal cord, out to the rest of, out to the rest of your, your limbs, and to the brain, right? And they get lodged up in those small arteries. So risk factors, inhaling while pushing the purge button, problematic ascent, so breath holding, uh, rapid uncontrolled, and then equipment issues. So this is kind of the way it goes. So you have this pulmonary overinflation. It causes some of this rupture, and then it causes bubbles in that pulmonary interstitium there. And that can go to multiple different things. So arterial gas embolism is kind of the, the scariest one that we think of most. Um, but it can cause a pneumothorax, so it can pop, pop one of the lungs. Um, maybe just as small, you know, it's not saying that you'll necessarily have huge issues breathing, but you'll have some injury. And it can cause kind of some of these bubbles to get into around your heart or up in here. And you'll see uh, if you kind of get some bubbles up in there, it's almost like Rice Krispies. You can kind of push, push on the skin there. So not all of them are serious, um, but certainly arterial gas embolism is the most serious, right? So it can happen even, as, even if you're doing a basic pool dive as that, you know, for that first time diver. Um, if you hold your breath and you're down at 10 feet and you surface from 10 feet, there is a risk for, for arterial gas embolism. So that's why I just ascend nice and slow. It's usually sudden and dramatic presentation, right? So the symptoms that we see are dizziness, blurred vision, decreased sensation anywhere. May have some chest pain from that bubbles, those air, that air in the, in the chest there, or disorientation. And then the signs that we can look at, folks, is they may have some paralysis or weakness. Uh, you may be having some seizures or convulsions. Uh, or complete cessation of breathing or unconsciousness, right? So these are going to present within that first 10 minutes. Now, is it important if we diagnose them to say, hey, you have arterial gas embolism and you have decompression sickness? No, you can get decompression sickness, you know, within that first 10 minutes as well. But ultimately, the treatment's the same, right? The treatment, you know, we may think it's a little scarier. We may want to get, get there a little bit faster but the treatment's the same. If they're having some sort of neurological effects, you know, we're gonna wanna get them moving along. But a lot, and sometimes they'll have both. Uh, so most importantly though, you will see this usually within the first 10 minutes of surfacing. So immediately contact uh, EMS. And then I know a lot of the rescue divers and the instructors are trained in CPR. So you, know, you can start CPR if necessary and trained. Get them on oxygen. Again, the earlier, the better for 100% oxygen. Don't forget to keep the patient warm. Uh, certainly some risk for hypothermia as well in, in certain spots. Uh, probably not right now here, uh, but certain areas. And then you can, if you know how to do a neuro neurological exam, you can start your neurological exam. One of the other important keys is, is uh, that I think they hit in a lot of the courses too, is don't necessarily let this patient walk around or, or be very careful with this patient, right? So either lay them on their back in the supine position or that lateral recumbent position um, are, both, are both good positions to keep that patient in. All right, and then recompression is the treatment of choice, initiated as soon as possible. So prevention, easy, right? Normal ascent, breathe, relax, and just good buoyancy control. So the last, the last topic that I just wanna, that I wanna touch upon is some of the ear stuff, and I have some good pictures in here as well. I know a lot of people may have experienced some of these issues and don't really know what to do after they, they have a, a ruptured eardrum or something along those lines. So uh, the first one's an external ear squeeze. So that's everything from, from your eardrum out, right? So how do we, how do we get that? Um, usually if, if you have any sort of wax uh, impaction that can happen, um, or abnormal bone growth or inflammation, or if you're in colder spots when you're wearing a wetsuit or any sort of earplugs, uh, you may you can experience this as well. If you're wearing something on the outside here, you may have a pressure. You're going to create a pressure differential here, and what that can actually do is cause that eardrum to move in. Most of the time, when you have it, it's pushing its way out, but that can cause that pressure, and then that can cause some symptoms. So the best way to do that is adjust your hood. You can abort the dive if you need to. Try not to stick anything in there. Q-tips are probably not a good idea to be shoving in, in the ear if you're having some of these issues. Um, if, and then if you do have some sort of hearing loss or any blood kind of in, that, in the canal there, then you can certainly seek care. So the middle ear, this is the most common one we see, right? So you're a little bit congested, a little bit sick, 
Or, or some people just have issues, right? One ear, my left ear is usually a little bit slower. If I'm sick, I'm, pr I'm not going to dive. Um, so the most common thing, it's, it's in an, most commonly in inexperienced divers where they have ineffective valsalva or swallowing. So you'll have poor eustachian tube function. Uh, and again, that congestion, you can have anatomical issues um, with like that uh, deviated nasal septum or large tonsils or history of ear infections. So the signs and symptoms of this are pain during descent, uh, mild transient conductive hearing loss. So that just means it, you may have hearing loss for you know, a few weeks period of time and that's normal. That hearing will come back, right, most, in most cases. You may see blood in the face mask. Um, you may have kind of some of that dizziness from, from the ears being uh, unequal, right? May cause some ringing in the ears and then it could cause some possible long-term hearing loss. So this here, just some pictures, I like pictures. I don't know if you, anyone's ever looked in ears, but I look in a lot of ears. And this is, this is normal. So this is your normal eardrum. It's kind of nice and, and, and clear. You can kind of see through it, a little bit opaque. Here, this, this is when you might have gotten a little bit of a squeeze, right? So you kind of see this redness. And that, you know, you might have been sick. You might have had some issues going down. You kind of had to try a couple times at 15 feet, but then you were able to get past that. That's probably where your ear looks like the next day. This is a little bit worse, a little bit progressing from there. You kind of see these specks of blood, and that's when those vessels behind your ears were really having issues and really getting stressed. Um, and that's kind of getting to that angry ear. This is a little bit more, uh, certainly more impressive where you have a lot of blood behind there, but still, you know, there's no rupture there. And then this is certainly a minor rupture, which will very well heal up. Um, and this is a little bit more severe of a rupture that may have some issues healing up and get you to a uh, ear, nose, throat doctor a little sooner. So what do we do for these, right? So those, those mild cases, uh, the most important thing is restrict diving until it's healed up, right? So the best thing I do for my active duty divers that get this a lot, you know, I'll follow them, I'll keep an eye on them, and I'll, I'll look in their ears every, every couple days, and I won't let them dive until, they get back, until they're cleared up. Um, for, for you guys, it's a little bit harder to you know, necessarily go seek care every couple days. So if it's just mild, you just had a, you just had a little bit of issues, you, you may be able to dive the next day, um, but it would be better to sit out for a couple days, maybe wait till next weekend kind of thing. A little bit worse, still is a little bit of pain, you know, certainly give it, give it a little more time, uh, one to eight days. Those more severe cases though, where there is a perforation, those are the ones that we sit out for at least 30 days, right? Give yourself some time. And if it's you and you know you had some blood kind of come out of your ear, that's when you definitely want to get seen. You don't necessarily need to see your doctor for these two, the mild and moderate, but definitely when you had a little bit of bleeding, a little bit of hearing loss, absolutely go see your doctor, right? And get that, make sure that heals up. Cause you know, 98% of them will heal up, but there's certainly a few that will have some more issues. All right, and then if, if there's issues, the doc can give you some antibiotics and, and check, check an audiogram. So other types of barotrauma are just your squeezes, your mass squeeze. You can kind of have some inner ear issues, but I won't focus a, a ton, of, ton on those. And then when do we return to diving after issues? You probably shouldn't be the one making this call, but typically for, I just wanted to share what we kind of do, typically for the pain only DCS, so this is, we, we, the Navy has much uh, more stringent uh, requirements for what we need to do. These are from the DAN website though. The DAN website's pretty good with this. So they say two weeks for like that knee, elbow, shoulder pain. Six weeks for some of those minor neurological things. So kind of if, if they're acting a little bit weird, a little dizziness, um, and we treated them six weeks certainly. And then for those more severe symptoms where you're having numbness and, and tingling in your legs and uh, paralysis, that's, you probably shouldn't be diving anymore. And then flying after diving, Navy always says 24 hours. I, this, this I just pulled from the Dan website, so you can kind of look that stuff out. Go, I would always stick with 24 hours, right? If you want to push it, you're going on a trip to Thailand trying to get a couple dives in, but know that there is a risk associated with that. And then these are just some emergency numbers. Definitely the, the Dan number is good. I think they also, I just came across a local like Japanese number as well that you can call. Um, and then um, these are more like on base, off base kind of numbers. And then that's this, this book here. This one's a good medicine book if, you, if you're interested, diving medicine, Bovian Davis. 
and then we go out. You can just Google the U.S. Navy dive manual if, if you're interested in reading it. It's pretty long. Uh, and then the Dan website's good. All right, so now we'll take some questions if, if anyone's got any. I'll shoot first. Yeah. Um, Japanese ambulances, fire engines, do they have O2 on board? Like, what, what do we expect if a Japanese, if we walk up to a Japanese fire station, say a toilet bowl? So does the, anybody know? Yes, yeah. they do have O2 on board. Uh, most of the time now, they carry at least one paramedic, but that's not absolutely guaranteed. But the O2 is on there. Uh, the ambulances are fully stocked. They actually use the same ambulance you guys use at the hospital. And it's exactly the same because I've been in both of them before. It's just everything's labeled in Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll, they'll do an on-the-road handoff too. So if you're getting picked up by a Japanese ambulance, they'll contact the local ambulance and they'll, they'll do a trade-off to, to get you on base if, if you are you know, a dependent or beneficiary. Um, and vice versa, if, if you're on base and there's an injury, and you're getting transported, like if you're up north and you're getting transported out into town, they'll do the handoff again and, and get you to a local hospital. So we've seen a lot more, uh, you know, we're typically very operational. Um, we've seen a lot more of these cases in the past couple of years, more so for, you know, really from the 60s up until two years ago, uh, Kadena had, had a chamber that they, that they treated a number of patients in. Um, and they, they've kind of they've kind of lost their mission a couple years ago and some of their funding so the primary really for anybody on island is to go to one of the local Japanese chambers right anybody who, who has you know who's a benefit a military beneficiary get them down to the, the hospital the hospital on foster and we'll get you get you properly uh, disposition but really the best chamber that we've identified on the island off base is, is down at Nambu um, down, down towards Naha. So there are some other chambers that do, that th those smaller ones, the mono place chambers that will, uh, they're really meant for wound care. Um, so they don't, they don't let you go as deep. Um, and ideally you need to get down to that 60 feet to see, to see benefit. Do you know what their chamber is rated to down there? The one at Nambu? Yeah. 60 feet. 60, 60 yeah. Feet. yeah. Yeah, they won't take them down to the, to 165 like we can do. They but again, can, they can at Nambu. Oh, they can. Yeah, Nambu's got a massive U.S. built chamber, and they can take you as deep. Ryukyu University also has a full chamber that can do uh, a full treatment. Nago Hospital has a smaller chamber, it's only rated to 60 feet. Though they can take you to 60, nice. do a full treatment, but they are mono place, okay. two mono place. But the big one at uh, Nambu can do uh, 160. They can do a lot. Uh, Ryukyu Hospital and Nambu Hospital is not available for United States treatment. Um, so the uh, Hospital is the only Pacific Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryukyu University Hospital, if you show up during business hours, they'll treat you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't show up at 5 o'clock. Yeah, or on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> so certainly kind of we, we talked about some of the 165. Uh, there's, there's still mixed research on pushing somebody all the way down to 165. Maybe if they were diving in the 130s, there will be some benefit, and you're thinking of it crush bubble. Um, not necessarily always the best thing, because unfortunately at 165 feet, you're not going to put someone on oxygen, because uh, oxygen is toxic at that level. You will cause that person to seize pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so you have to, we kind of weigh what's better. Should we try to theoretically crush this bubble, or are we going to try to drive that nitrogen out of the tissues with oxygen? So kind of mixed. I got another question for you. I think yes, there's a lot of people here who, I mean, most everybody's heard of the spike in incidents this year, particularly. I guess, is there any root cause analysis study been done? Is there any formal look at, are these one-offs or is this a trend? Because unless we know there's a problem, we can't fix a problem. So that's kind of where we are. We hear rumors, we see things posted on Facebook. It's not a great way to kind of push information out to the pro community who maybe are poised to you know, fix something yeah. if it's not working right? Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that there is a huge spike in injuries this year. We are seeing them because the Kadena Chamber closed down. The hospital is seeing a little bit more because they're not pushing them through the Air Force folks as much now. 
So the hospital and us are certainly seeing these patients. Um, there, a lot of what's come out is because we've had two really bad injuries where two patients are essentially paralyzed from waist down, right, right? and need assistance, urinating, and, and things like that. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a, say it's a spike. Um, the drive for all, for all this safety is because we had two really bad injuries, which, which happen, right? They happen in Guam. They, you know, some of the, we have yeah, a I, Navy I chamber out there. I appreciate that. Too, I think so. there's a lot of people under the impression that, you know, we're, we're all of a sudden having, you know, a gazillion uh, chamber rides all of a sudden. And there's, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of that here, though. You know, with probably thousands of Sure, thousands it's, it's of all here. about, it's all about is this, background you know yeah. is this part of the background noise of dive incidents or are we seeing something yeah, abnormal I think, like said, I think it's just a matter of uh, the visibility of these last two okay. major, uh, yeah. major issues yeah. presented so yeah, I don't I think honestly everyone in this room is doing the right thing right a, a lot of you are are dedicated divers right taking the time to this is you know more than a hobby for you it's kind of a lifestyle right and you're you're doing the things to be safe you know, you're maintaining your, your own equipment a lot of times. You're upgrading your watches when they need to be upgraded. You're making sure the battery is good. You're making sure it's set on, you know, oxygen and, or air and not nitrox when it is. You, you're, the group here is really probably not the group we necessarily need to be pushing all the safety to, but you're the folks that are going to give it to other people, right? Whether it's you taking your dive buddies out and keeping an eye on them that aren't familiar with it. or trying not to take your dive buddy out who's a basic open water diver to the USS Emmons and then you know, ha having issues along those lines, right? So it, so it, it really starts for, from the instructors and from, from the group that's really interested in diving because you wanna see this continue here on the island. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful island to dive on. Um, so I think it's just a matter of taking this information and, and making sure you're continuing to teach it in all the, in all the courses. Um, and knowing that, you know, a lot of divers out here are not, you know, experts, are not really experienced with it. A lot of them come out here and they may only be out here for six months and they're, and they're diving out there. So keep an eye on other folks that you see out there as well when you're diving. Was there anything we saw in those two accidents that possibly led to the bad outcomes, such as delay in treatment or something they did on a particular dive yeah. that maybe can be corrected? Yeah, well, uh, I, I spoke to it a little bit about diving within your limits. Uh, one of them, uh, she was well, well, in my opinion, outside of her own, what she knew to be her own limits personally, and then outside of her certified limits as well. Um, not real comfortable, um, you know, if you can't, if you're not comfortable with a flooded mass, that's something, you know, you need to work up to. Basically, what happened was the mass flooded, and then there was an uncontrolled ascent from that point on, from about 40 feet, I think it was. So, that, you know, we can pinpoint that dive and say that's where this dive went wrong, because from that point on, Everything went south. With the other one, it was harder to pinpoint. You know, it was, the diver exceeded the limits a little yeah. bit. Um, according to a Navy dive profile, you know, it, I'll, I'll reference the Navy dive manual because that's what I use. Um, it was outside of no decompression limits. It would have been a decompression dive. However, he was using his computer. Um, it, he met all of his uh, his requirements to. And he made his safety stop. Uh, just at that stop is when it, you know it could have just been a physiological thing. There was no real one thing that we could pinpoint on that dive to say this is where this dive went wrong other than you know just maybe bad planning uh, as far as you know the depth of the dive how about after the case was there it, delays it, in treatment yeah or yeah cer or yeah delays? certainly and that was that was the one thing kind of we identified for for at least one of them uh, just getting oxygen on board as soon as possible right a lot of the uh, not all of the local boats uh, will carry oxygen. So if you're you know, involved with some of the local boats or you're diving on a local boat, having oxygen is always good, right? Breathing, you know, even if you're out there with nitrox, you, that's not 100% oxygen, right? You'll get a little bit extra oxygen on board to, to blow out the nitrogen, but it, it's not as good as 100% oxygen, right? So there certainly was a delay in getting oxygen, right? So if you're out, if you're out on a dive and it's still gonna take 40, 40 minutes to an hour to get back, and then from there, you know, drive to the hospital as opposed to riding an ambulance. That's, you know, two hours where, you know, especially in some of the spinal DCS, um, there's not a ton of research out there, but they have shown that there has been completely spontaneous improvement with just being on 100% oxygen. So I'm saying a lot of symptoms will get better with just oxygen. Not everyone needs to get pressed, 
but right. certainly getting oxygen. And, and, and I know a lot of people get the oxygen provider course, um, but there are some difficulties getting access to oxygen all the time as well. So uh, certainly that's one thing that can be improved. So that's why we kind of pressed upon that a lot. Yeah, and, and in a perfect world, you would be able to go right from the dive site and go directly pull up to the front door of the chamber, right? Just throw them in the chamber, you know, and, uh, and press minimal, minimal surface interval. But we're in, it's not a perfect world and we have to go through the, you know, ambulance to the hospital, the hospital is gonna make their assessment and phone calls and then transport to the, to the next available chamber. And there's usually hours, you know, between reaching surface and leaving surface in a chamber. And that, that definitely impacts uh, success rate, but um, either way, it's still as quick as possible, refreshing to treatment of choice. Yeah, Can the lay cause we need to I mean, it's, it's probably uh, unassociated. Um, usually if it's there in your joint, it's probably not gonna go anywhere. That pain may get worse if there's a delay. Um, it may just be progression of the disease, right? You may just have more nitrogen coming out of the tissues as you're, as you're still breathing air on surface. So getting oxygen on is gonna prevent, may prevent something worse from happening. But as I said, most of that, most of your neurological symptoms you are going to see fairly rapidly. It's not, and by that, I mean really within that first kind of like 12 hours. Um, yeah. But if we're not sure, just seek care. Question for you. Um, assuming that you have an oxygen pit in your vehicle, um, what's, would you recommend starting the transport to the hospital on foster or waiting for the ambulance to arrive at the dock or dive site? What's the break even? Well, if you have the oxygen, you have enough to get them there, then I, I would transport. Because that, like I said, that time between, uh, if you have a no, a no kidding, uh, sure thing, decompression uh, sickness or DCI, um, you know, you know where they need to go, but you have to just go through the protocol. Get them on that oxygen, go ahead and get them to the hospital. Right. So they, uh, it uh, depends if your patient's unconscious or conscious. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. If they're, you know, if it's kind of pain only or some minor symptoms, yeah, absolutely take them in. But, you know, the, I think the ambulance is out here, ride lights and sirens all the time. So it's, they'll, they'll get you there pretty fast. Um, I'm going to ask, the is, the majority of people who go out there and dive are going to have a green box with them. Yep. They're going to have their O2. But we're not necessarily going to be able to intravenously inject fluids in the patient. Oxygen is going to be the most important. We start the fluids uh, more so because a lot of the patients are either already dehydrated and that's what caused them to have the injury or they're going to get dehydrated while they're, while they're getting pressed. So fluids are good, um, but oxygen is better. Oxygen is going to be what, what clears you up and what fixes you. The fluids are just going to rehydrate you.